This is the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast, where we're crazy passionate about building leaders. If you're new with us, we drop a brand new episode on the first Thursday of every month. But guess what? This isn't the first Thursday, so that means this must be a bonus episode. That's right. Before I introduce our guest for the day, I want to tell you that I do have a new book coming out uh, the first week of February. The book is called Dangerous Prayers because following Jesus was never meant to be safe. I think the title should be pretty clear. If you're looking for a leadership book, this is not the book that you're looking for. This is a book to help people grow in their faith. Uh, For those of you that would say, I do believe in God, some of you might say, I don't have a great prayer life. I wish that I did. This book will help build your faith and hopefully strengthen your prayer life. Today, we're talking all about leadership, and I could not be more excited to introduce our guest to you. Let me tell you about him. Jerry Hurley is not only one of my best friends in the world, but he's truly one of the best leaders that I've ever worked with. I've wanted to have you on for quite some time. I needed the excuse, and guess what? I think we have the perfect excuse. Jerry, glad to have you on. Well, it's great to be here, and now I can check this off my bucket list to be on the <laughs> Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. So check next, off the, bu- yeah, check off next, the bucket list. Uh, Paris or something more exciting on <laughs> your bucket list. But I don't know. This is pretty good. Anyway, I, I'll tell. I want to tell our audience a little bit about you, and then um, kind of tell why I think that you're going to add a lot of value. Before Jerry served on our staff, which you been on our staff now for almost 22 years, almost 22 years. And as a side note, one of the things that I'm most thankful for and proud of, of our team, our directional leaders, there's four of us have all been together for over two decades, which is incredibly rare to have a leadership team stay together for that long. And um, this organization is a reflection of the great leaders that I have. Before Jerry was with us um, on our church staff, Jerry was a district team leader for Target. And so you you were over 11? 11 stores, yeah. 11, 11 stores. So you brought a lot of business leadership into um, an early, a young church, sure. which added a lot of value. Sometimes I think, Jerry, people think of, you know, like a church is just all, you know, spiritual prayers and such. And there's a lot of that, but you really added a lot from a business perspective. Right. And I, I think most of us actually that are on our leadership team actually didn't take a traditional path um, into church leadership. We actually came from the business world. You even had a lot of experience in the business world before you came. So I just think it was really natural for us to operate this church as a business on the operation side. So I've heard you refer to it as a spiritual business. Yes. It is spiritual, but it's definitely definitely a business and we need to approach it with the same kind of intentionality that any business would. Yeah, I, so I do think that for those who are church leaders out there, we never wake up thinking church is a business first, Right. but we deal with people, we have bills to pay, we manage finances. And so I think that it actually is a good thing to have a business mindset. Absolutely. And we are about the business of helping change lives. And so I, I think that's important for people to say, don't apologize for it. It's no. actually the honoring thing to do to run it well. Uh, the reason that I wanted you on now is our church just received kind of another honor okay. in um, the category of having a really good team. And recently we were named by Glassdoor. I think a lot of people would know this is an organization that allows um, employees to kind of give anonymous right. feedback. We were rated by Glassdoor of all the companies and organizations in the nation in small to mid-sized organizations. We sure. were ranked the number one best organization to work in. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, really excited about it, Craig. It's, um, it is a tremendous, a tremendous honor actually and a tremendous accomplishment for our team. And it does just speak to some of the things that you've talked about, about how our, our approach to what we do is all about doing things really, really well. Yep. So the reason you're on, Jerry, is because kind of like I told our team, this award is a reflection of your leadership and your team leading. So Jerry's over human relations, HR, and over team development, and kind of in many ways, the um, guardians of the culture. And you don't end up with, you know, we have almost 800 team members. Mm-hmm. So this is not a mom pop organization. Right. It's, a, it's that's a lot of moving parts in 10 different states, soon to be 11 different states. So we're real, real spread out. It's really hard to keep that many people super engaged, 
moving in the same direction. So I wanna get into your mind, how you think as a leader and how you've created a culture that people are passionate about, love to be a part sure. of and and are begging to get onto the team. So right. uh, let's start with culture. Um, one of the things I admire most about your leadership is your team really creates a great culture. What, what would you say, Jerry, are some of the biggest contributing factors to um, a culture that's thriving and, and moving in the right direction? Well, for, from our perspective, it would have to, one, we, we, we first of all, you have to have a mission that is that everybody can get behind and be excited about. And that's just the first part of it. But then you do have to have, you have to have the right team members and you really have to have a set, from our perspective, we think it's a set of values that draws us all together mm -hmm. and that we can all rally around that's true of how we operate. And all of those things work together to have a great culture. But we also can't separate that you have to have the right team to be able to have a great culture. And what we try to spend a lot of time doing is helping our team at the individual level own the responsibility of making this such a great place. In other words, it's not, you lead well, and, and I lead well, and leadership has a part to play, but if your culture is really gonna do what you want it to do, it has to be embraced and owned at the, all 700 team members need to wake up every day and say, you know what, I'm gonna reflect positively on what it means to be part of our team. And to the degree that you can do that, and I think our team is, it, has bought into that and they own that, and they wake up every day excited to come to work, excited about what they get to do, and they're making the decision, I'm gonna make this place special. Yep, so let's, I, I wanna get into how do you identify and build the right team in a little bit, because right. that's super important. But let's get real practical about the values. I think most organizations hopefully have some values. They right. might be clear and stated, or they might be um, mm -hmm. accidental. You know, yeah, but they right. they do have them. So hopefully, we're we're going to assume that people do have intentional, clearly stated values. What would you say? Some things that your team does to intentionally drive the values into right. the core of the organization? You know, a, a lot of times people think that culture is a really difficult thing and it's not really difficult, but it takes a lot of intentionality. And what I would say is be consistent over time with the same thing. You have to build a common language and you have to build around, I think, a common set of tools and just a common, some commonality that people begin to, to, to use a language that makes sense. And if, if you chase after the latest and greatest leadership book or you're chasing after you know the, the, the latest thing that you're doing and you don't build any consistency then I think you're going to miss the opportunity to drive culture deep into the organization so really what we do is we r repeat over and over and over again our values why they're important what is okay behavior that's okay behavior that's not okay and we just repeat it over and over and over again so, so tell me how oh and, and, what and everywhere mean? so when in our hiring process our hiring process is built around these sets of values. Um, so that's just a part. So the first time anybody interacts with us, they're gonna interact around that set of values. We only bring people on the team that these values are part of who they are. And we can talk more about that mm -hmm. uh, maybe later. Um, but then, so that's part. When we onboard people onto the team, we bring everybody in the organization to a two-day event. We call it Inside Out. That's our orientation process. It's all about reinforcing our values. They get an opportunity to hear from you. Mm -hmm. They get an opportunity to hear from all of our um, all of our key leaders in the organization. And all of those conversations are just reinforcing these values over and over and over again. The things that we appreciate, the things that we reward as a team, the things that we celebrate as a team, all of those things reinforce this same set of values. And so literally all of the human systems in the organization, hiring, um, how, how you bring people onboarding, what you actually, what people get in trouble for, all of those things should be cohesive around the set of values that drive the organization. Okay, so that's helpful because I think a lot of people wouldn't think about introducing the values even at the point of hiring. And so right. even before someone's um, on the team, we're introducing the values and then driving them deep. I, I would say, and correct me if I'm wrong, would, would there be, would we ever get together with a big group of people and not do something that's value oriented? Never. Never. It's always something about that event, something about the conversation, something about what is shared is always gonna point back to a value. Yep. Uh, and and it just and, and there's it's not it's not about the newest and latest thing. It's about finding these sets of values that you can really live out, and then living them out. And here's the other thing I would say about values: is if I can't remember a time where keeping a value cost me something, then I would question whether or not we really have a value. In other words, if we let's say there's somebody that we really needed, he was a, or she was an incredibly talented person, but we knew that they weren't a fit value wise. If we didn't say no to that person, if it didn't cost me that person, then I would say 
I don't really know if that's a value for me. So uh, values are important. And at the end of the day, values are going to cost you something. It's going to make it harder. It's going to make it more expensive. It's going to, it's, you're going to feel it in a certain way if it actually is a true value. I want to highlight that because I think it's a good point for someone to reflect on. If you have a value and it's never cost you something, then maybe it's not a value at all. And that's okay, actually, if you recognize we claim this is a value, but it's not. Right. Then acknowledge it's actually not really a value and make sure that you're living according to what you really do value. So not, not just claimed values, but what do, what do we really, 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 really right. value? Yeah. So, Jerry, I imagine that there would be a lot of people listening right now that would say, okay, I'm a part of a culture that's not healthy. Mm-hmm. And we don't like it and we want to change it. What advice would you have for the leaders of that organization? Well, first of all, changing a culture is is going to take a lot of time and energy and effort. So first thing I would say is just recognize that it's going to take more time and energy than you probably think it's going to, but it's going to be worth it. So you're going to have to see it through. Mm-hmm. Even if I was going to introduce something new to our culture, which is already pretty strong and pretty cohesive, I would plan on it taking a year of intentional effort before I could actually get that actually into the cultural language. So it just takes a long time. Turning a culture would be even more difficult. But the first thing I would do, once I recognize that, the first thing I would do is just understand, okay, what do we want this culture to look like? And again, I I believe that that's gonna come down to a set of values. What's really important to you? Because if it's not important to you as a leadership group, whoever that is, or a leader, then it's not going to actually come out of you and be replicatable. So anyway, so find out who you, what your values are, find out where the disconnects are, and then just set a plan and consistently drive that value into your team. And it is going to take more time and energy than you think, but at the end of the day, it is so worth it. The other thing that is, is a sad fact, but it's probably true, if you're going to actually change a culture... I would not expect everybody on your team to be able to move with you. That's going to be another part of it that you just have to be willing to accept that not everybody on your team may be able to make the change. Yes. So I want to highlight a couple of things that you said because I, I don't want someone to miss it. You said it might take a year before you even start kind of imparting the values right. and longer to actually change, change to, turn, to, turn, to turn the culture. I agree 100%. And I wish that I could say, Hey, you can do this in three months. Mm-hmm. And the problem is that you're you are changing unhealthy mindsets. You're deprogramming yes. people from maybe being skeptical, mm-hmm. not trusting leadership, seeing the bad. That's right. And and so it's like detoxing a body. And and you said it. It takes it takes a long time. You also said it's absolutely and completely worth it. Yes. Um, Let's just kind of get down into the uh, the how. For example, uh, as of right now, we're in 34 different locations. Right. Some of them are 15, 16, 18 years old and such. And so there have been seasons where there'll be a pocket of a culture that's not real healthy. Right. And so let's say someone's got a team, uh, a smaller portion of the team that's not healthy and you're gonna come in and consult. What do you do first to it maybe are you trying to detox the mm-hmm. bad behavior or bad thinking, or are you trying to replace? Like, what, what what goes into your mind to coach that leader? Well, so I would start with the leader because the leader is the, the, the team is going to be a reflection of the leader. So I would I would begin to coach the leader and make sure that the leader understood the difference between the way that they were leading and what I expected. Then I would just need to make sure that the leader was was willing to buy in. Yes, because if the leader wasn't willing to truly buy into it, then. I, again, I'd have a decision to make at that point, but let's just say the leader was willing to buy in, then I would begin to just coach the leader on how to coach his team to understand what the important, what really is important and, and where we're actually um, off track. So clues that I would listen for is if somebody begins to, if I begin to hear, oh, that person, being a, having 34 locations, we will move team members from location to location with some regularity. And if I were beginning to hear something like, oh, well, that team member won't work on my team, or, or I hear begins, oh, well, that team member won't work on my team because they're coming from a different a culture, a different team, then that's actually a red flag for me. So we should be able to have a culture that is consistent enough to where if I needed to move a team member from team A to team B, there should be no real impact in, in like, it's not, they shouldn't have to go and learn a whole new language. Mm-hmm. And we've had times where that's been the case and we've had to go in and, and what I would say is one, work with the leader, but I'm going to have to bring extreme energy to that situation to actually 
correct the culture because momentum is real. And so there's a, there's the you know the law of physics: an object will continue in motion until an equal or greater force changes its direction. And so I have, what I have to recognize is I have to overcome the momentum of what's already happening in that location with with pretty significant energy, mm -hmm. so I can actually change the direction. The other thing I would say is that is that culture is happening every single day, mm -hmm. whether I think about it or not, whether you think about it or not. Uh, it is is happening, and I don't think there are days that it's a, a zero sum. I think every day we're going to make the culture better, clearer, sharper, um, or we're, it's going to become less clear, less sharp, less less meaningful. So I don't think there's any days that are just okay. It's a zero sum. You're either making it better or it's getting worse. So that's a, that's a big statement and and pretty extreme. And I think I would agree with you 100 percent that culture's drifting somewhere. Yes, it's never static. Mm -mm. We're either making it better, or we're make, or or it's drifting the wrong way. And again, I want to highlight a couple of things you said because I th think this is really important. If the culture's gone bad under a specific leader, the first place you look is not downstream. You look at that That's leader, true. and based on experience, a lot of times you have to change a leader in order to mm -hmm. to s create a better culture. Would you agree? Yes. Yes. Um, we are going to give that leader a chance Completely. to come around. So we're gonna, we're going to help the leader see where there's a disconnect. But if that leader, he or she doesn't own it, can't see it, then you may have to replace the leader. The other thing you said, I wanna to highlight too, Jerry, you talked about, you probably will turn some team members. And that's incredibly painful, but you kind of have to prepare your mind. That's just a part of it, it because it's really, really hard mm -hmm. to, to ch take a whole team to change their mindset. Right. And if you are turning people, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd kind of put it in my mind that that might be right. very likely. Yes, and and, and actually, that, that's the, the benefit of having a culture that is really clearly defined and everybody understands, understands the language, how we treat each other, how we treat each other, how we treat our customers. Uh, it, it, it actually does help because it's easy for us to recognize when things are not culture. So like, let's say the example we just talked about, there's a team leader that's not quite got it and he's leading his or her team in a direction that's kind of drifting. A lot of times the place we're gonna hear about it first is from a team member that goes to that team and they're gonna know Look, this doesn't. This does not feel right. This right. does not feel like. And so we're going to know about it. The, the The sad thing is, is so many cultures out there are so muddy and not clear that nobody even knows it, what what it should even look like. Yep. So there's no way to tell is it good or is it right. And that's that's a big problem. Uh, so turning a culture, a lot of that is clarifying the culture would be a lot of my strategy and actually changing a culture. Mm -hmm. Yep. And. Um, it, the key to all of it, as you know, we've talked about for years and years, is, is always the people. Mm -hmm. uh, great, uh, great products are created by great people. Great cultures are created by great people. Right. Um, the right systems are created by the best people. And so, you know, we really are passionate about finding yes. and developing people. Let's start with the the finding part. When you're um, and Jerry's trained teams of people to interview. So we've got how, how many people are equipped to uh, Oh, interview? there's probably a couple of hundred now that are actually equipped and trained to actually interview. Yes. So of our team, you know, probably one in four-ish or, or more are prepared to interview. When you are training them, uh, what are you teaching the interviewers to look for to yeah. identify the best? So the first thing that we look for is competency. And, but actually that is, is probably the first, let's figure the overall process. The first 10% is about competency because one, it's the easiest thing for me to, to understand. Does a person actually have the competency to do the role? Uh, and it's one of the, it's one of the less likely reasons somebody's actually not going to be successful. Very few people actually lose their job because they're not competent, but it is important that they have competency. So the first thing we would do is focus on competency. Then the other 90% of the process is built around, do they fit in our organization? Are their values aligned with our values? We have two key sets of values, our core values. And internally, when we're talking about the hiring process, we say we use the term aligning values. And the concept there is if the things that you're passionate about, just inherently the things that the organization is passionate about, if those things are aligned, then we can have somebody on our team and we're going to be able to walk a long time together before those paths diverge. Just because our passions are the things that make you mad, make us mad. The things that make you cheer, make us cheer. And then the next set of values are a lot of people refer to as permission to play values. We call them sustaining attributes. Things like being able to work hard, being flexible, being resilient. Some of those are some of our values. We call them sustaining attributes. And the whole thing about that is for somebody to 
to sustain over the long haul on our team, these need to be true of them. Just like to play on a professional uh, soccer team, there are certain skill sets you have to have. To play on our team, there's certain attributes that need to be true of you if you're actually going to make it here the long haul. Because the truth of the matter is, is Life Church is an amazing place to work, uh, but it is not an easy place to work. So I need a special group of people. So we spend a lot of our time helping our team understand how do we how do we understand the values that we're looking for, and then how do we understand how do I see them in you, and ask the right questions and put you through the right process to where then I can actually have a pretty good idea that those are true of you. Mm-hmm. And if that's the case, then somebody has a good shot of being on our team. So I'm guessing there are some people who say, oh, okay, sustaining attributes, that's a new term to me. I haven't thought about that before. So when we're interviewing, according to what you're, how you're coaching is the first 10%, if, if you don't have the competency, we're not even gonna look at you. Yeah, so, that's right. But that's relatively easy to determine. It's, it's easier, yes. It's easier. And from there, we're gonna look at heart, we're gonna look at uh, your okay. values, uh, do you have what it takes? If you're talking to someone that says, oh my gosh, I've never even thought about sustaining attributes of what makes people successful, how would you coach them to determine those mm-hmm. so that they could hire toward them? Yeah, I would look at it like, imagine your organization as a team. What are the, what are the things that need to be, what kind of, does a person need to be able to have stamina? Uh, like, like I talked about soccer, right? Do they need to be able to handle the ball? Of course they do. Uh, so I would look at, here's how we did it. What we did is, and actually this was born out of a time when we weren't actually being as successful as, as we wanted to be in our retention rate with people we brought on the team. And we realized that more than we were comfortable with, we're not being successful. So what we did is we studied our very best team. We studied the people on our team that were thriving. And we said, what do they have in common? And we came up with a list. Oh man, work ethic. They sometimes have to be able to work hard. Man, resilience, because this is not an easy place to work. Sense of humor was on the list. Um, Things like integrity, um, humility, teachability. uh, teachability. Um, And so flexibility is another because we're a high change organization. And so we did is we we looked at our very best and the people that were thriving said, what do they have in common that some of the people don't? And then we built our list from there. So if I was encouraging somebody to look for it, I would say, I would say, look at the people in your organization that are doing it the best. What do they have in common? And look for more of that. So here's what's crazy. I wonder how many years ago that was. I'm going to guess 15 oh, years Oh, it was ago 2001, ago. 2002. So yeah. lo- longer than that. Yeah. And I remember you coming in and sitting down and we, we kind of together said, not based on position, but just based on effectiveness. Yes who are our best players? And we kind of agreed on however many it was. And then we went through and they all had those same attributes. And this was an incredibly, what's what's interesting is almost to the exact attribute, they're the same today as they were 18, 19, 20 years ago. And that's really helped shape who we are. It's not just, we're not just looking for the most talented people. We're also looking for the heart values that we believe in the same thing, but we're also looking for the behavioral values or the right. those those attributes that help sustain us. And that's really shaped us. Again, another thing I wanna highlight that you said, just so everybody's really clear, there were there were years where we would not have been the best place to work. <laughs> you know, there were years yeah. where our turnover was was high. We were mm-hmm. making a lot of mistakes. We had um, toxicity in the culture. There was there was mistrust. What do you do when you're there right now? Let's say there's a there's a culture that there's not a lot of trust. Right. How does how does someone build that? Well, first of all, I think trust is is kind of a complicated issue, and I'm going to oversimplify it, uh, and I'm I'm going to intentionally do that. But I believe trust is a choice, and I believe I can choose to trust somebody or I can choose not to. And in fact, we have a saying at Life Church is that most people would say uh, trust is earned. At Life Church, we say trust is given, mistrust is earned, and I think that that's an important that's a, that's an important distinction. And, and trust comes into it's not whether I trust you with my money or can I give you ten bucks and you're going to spend it. Of, of course, most people are, are going to be trustworthy in that way, but it's do I trust you when I don't fully understand what you are saying, or you send me an email and maybe it's maybe it's got some blanks in it that I've got to fill in. Mm-hmm. How do I fill in the blanks? Am I assuming the best or, or am, I am I assuming, assuming the, the worst? worst? Do mm-hmm. I just believe that you have my best interest at heart? Mm-hmm. And so we spend a lot of time in one, helping people under our team understand that we trust them, mm-hmm. uh, which can be hard for some people to believe actually, especially if they come from another environment. Coming from a dysfunctional culture, that's they exactly right. mistrust. They think that there's mm-hmm. some hidden agenda and we said there's not. And so we exhibit and we trust people to lead from day one. Uh, and then we expect them to trust us as well. Mm-hmm. And, and what's at stake is, is speed. It's if, if I have to wait to build trust with everybody that, that I wanna influence or mm-hmm. I want to ask to do something for me, 
then by the time I build all of that trust, the opportunities will have long since passed us by. So it's imperative, and that's you know part of our inside out. We talk a lot about what does trust look like? What does it mean? What happens if someone violates your trust? Is it over then? And we'd say, no, you have to go to that person and reconcile and then, again, retrust. And it's, you know, the golden rule is do unto others, you have them do unto you. If I asked you, Craig, do you want me to trust you? You would say, of course. Yep. Everybody wants to be trusted, and so we should extend trust. Yep. And it's a big part of our culture. It's a big part of things we talk about. So here's a funny question. And uh, do you and I ever disagree? <laughs> uh, about about 45 minutes ago. <laughs> about four, so like, like literally about, about, about 45 literally, minutes ago, yeah. the the sparks kind of flew. Oh, absolutely, 100%. Like, is that true? 100%, like, yeah. Like, I, was, I, was, I was upset with you and you were upset with me. Yeah, and there might still be some ashes smoldering somewhere. <laughs> Probably somewhere. But, but uh, what's, and, and I want everybody to hear this, like we're not exaggerating, like literally it was relatively heated. Literally, and yeah. What? Here we are having a podcast 45 100%. minutes later and- that's because there's trust. A hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yes. And you're even allowed to disagree with me and get up into my face. And, and you know, Greg, when we talk about, there's a lot of pieces into why our leadership team has been together as long as it has. And a big part of that is for you, loyalty is, is two ways. And you expect loyalty as you should, but you also extend a great deal of loyalty to us. And you also um, empower us in ways that is really unusual for a leader with your capability. And, and maybe it's because you're such a capable leader that you're comfortable enough to empower us to do that. And we've had a lot of, you and I are really different people. And we've had a lot of disagreements over the years, but I think that that has actually made me a better, more complete leader because you push me in ways that are not natural to me, but it always leaves me in a better place than- And vice versa. And, and I, think, I think that's part of it. If someone were to say, you know, which one of us wins, I think that's the wrong, that's the wrong place to look at it. It's how do we collectively get to someplace neither one of us could get together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the real benefit about having people that are different uh, around you as a leader. And the other thing that's that's uh, unique, uh, I think for you, Craig, is the willingness, and, and we have a great high feedback culture. People talk about that. That is a big part of our of our development culture is just, uh, this really high feedback, which is again, part of why people need to be resilient on our team because sometimes it can be hard to hear. But you have modeled that from day one. Um, in fact, there was a conversation I had uh, just yesterday where you actually did a uh, taping in front of a group of, in front of an yeah, audience. That was yesterday. Yep. And, um, and the people in the audience that don't interact with you regularly were surprised at the level of feedback that you invited and how quickly you incorporated the feedback into the, the very next time that you did that. And that's just, you can't, you, know, you talk about values and you talk about culture. Uh, what you lead as a leader does shape the culture in the organization. And you do so many of those things so well. Thank you. you. You know, feedback is a massive, massive important mm -hmm. tool. W without it, we're incredibly vulnerable. And what's so shocking to me is sometimes people will receive feedback as, you know, you're like, you're criticizing me. Mm -hmm. But when you do trust someone, you recognize this yes. is one of the greatest expressions of it's love and gift. care and missional heart is to say, I care about you enough to try to help yes. make you better. And, um, you know, that's something that's not common in a lot of organizations. What would you say to a leader that wants to, um, help their culture become a, a high feedback culture? Well, first you have to be able to exhibit it. You, in other words, as a leader, if you are not soliciting feedback, actively soliciting feedback and making it easy for people to give you feedback, because it would be very, if you walked up to a team member and asked for feedback, it could be a relatively intimidating thing, not because you're an intimidating person, but because of your position. And so you just have to realize that. So uh, first thing I would say is go and actively solicit feedback and then provide opportunities and mechanisms to do that. Whether it's a, maybe it's an anonymous feedback tool. We use, we use several of those multi-rater tools and those different kinds of things. Maybe you get feedback around different events. Just help your organization, give them opportunities to give feedback Make sure that you always respond in a positive way. In other words, don't, if, if, if someone gave you feedback and you responded in a negative way, they're never going to give you that feedback again. Right. If I did it, if I overreacted, then they're not ever going to do that because there's a lot of risk associated with that. So anyway, I would just be mindful of that and I would just try to make as many opportunities as I can for our team to give feedback and then make sure when they give it that you're, it's always appreciated and then always acted on in some way. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, incredibly important, and it does have to be modeled from does. you know those at the top. And so yesterday I, we did have probably a hundred people that came in to do a real short taping, 
and I did it three times. Mm -hmm. And and what was really special to me is that there were people that I didn't even know on our team that offered me feedback and helped make it better. Right. And that's that's special to be a part of an organization that that cares enough and 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 there's permission to give me as as sure. you know the senior leader that that type of feedback. But, but you position yourself to receive it. Yes. Which is, I, which I is unusual. It. That's exactly right. Yes. And most people don't realize how much pre-feedback that you get even before you ever deliver a, a message or you get so much feedback on the front side and all of that has a ripple effect in the organization. So give me some encouragement if I'm a, a team leader out there and I just, it, it's we're not in a great place right now. And you're coming in to say, you can be one day. What would you say to a, a leader that dis, is discouraged and maybe has some dysfunction, some mistrust, uh, maybe some of the wrong team members, maybe not strong values? What, what's possible through good leadership? Oh, I, I think through good leadership, I, I, think, I think anything is possible through good leadership if you're willing to spend the time and the energy and the effort to actually do it. And you just have a, a plan to, to do it. And, and so I think that there's one thing I would encourage anybody that's listening to this and they're in that same thing. I really am gonna refer them back to a couple of uh, prior episodes to the podcast because I think there are some really important ones that can dive what we're talking about and dive deeper. And so episode five and six is about building a value-driven culture. I would recommend that they do that. Episode 16 and 17 is about an empowering culture and has a lot a little bit about feedback. And then episode 19 and 20 is, is a lot about higher hiring and hiring process. And, and those episodes are gonna flesh out a lot of the things that we do all the time. So I would encourage people to go, if you're trying to figure it out, there's a lot of help in those prior episodes. But what I would say is, is understand who you are, understand where you wanna go, and then start today. And you tell us a lot, you say, you know, there are things that I can't do today, not even close. But if there are some things that I can do tomorrow that are gonna take me a step in the right direction, and if I take enough steps in the right direction, eventually I'll get to where I wanna go, I would view the problem in that way. What can I do tomorrow that's gonna help me at some point in time, if I keep doing the right steps, it's gonna actually get me where I wanna go. Clearly chart out a path, let your mission solve your problem. And I would say, what is my ultimate goal? Why am I here? Why are we here? What do we want to accomplish in, in the organization? And then, then work your way back from there. What are the values gonna take? And then start taking steps a little bit at a time. People will come and look at, the, at, look at where we are today and they'll be a little bit discouraged because it'll seem like we can never get that way or we can never become have the organization that you do and i say you know what it didn't happen overnight that's right you do the you do consistently the right things over and over and over again and eventually you'll have something that's really special mm -hmm. so don't be discouraged um, but don't be complacent and just take the do what you can tomorrow to work your way there and eventually you'll get there yeah you'll, you'll never end up there accidentally you never will and and there'll be a lot of hard decisions a lot of pain probably some turnover in the team mm -hmm rebuild with the right people. And it does take a lot of time, a lot yes. of effort. But when you are creating a healthy culture, the culture helps self-correct. Yes. When there's a problem, it, 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 it points out the problem early. It um, Other healthy people start correcting yes. the wrong types of behavior. And that goes a long way. So I, I want to tell you thank you. And it, thank you. Some, at a leadership event one time, someone said, what's the best decision you ever made? And I think they were probably thinking of some of the more creative or innovative things we've done in, through our organization. And I just replied instinctively, hire Jerry Hurley. Yeah. And, and I mean that because when you came on the team, we had probably, you know, we're a single location sure. in a little bicycle factory meeting. I was 29, maybe 30 years of age and had just a few hundred people coming and I was hitting a ceiling and your leadership instincts helped raise the ceiling. Uh, and I'm forever grateful for that. Uh, I, I want you to comment and finish with any other thoughts, but I'm really, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of an organization that was ranked number one, best place to work. But I never really had that as a goal. Like right. I, I never want, I, I never wake up thinking, I just want our people to be happy. Cause sometimes I actually don't mind them being a little bit unhappy sure. <laughs> in a certain place. To me, and you can correct me or add to this, what I want is, is this team full of people, so driven, so passionate, so selfless about something bigger than themselves that the byproduct is that we yes. love being together. And, and it's a healthy place that we enjoy, 
but that's the byproduct of something much yes. bigger. What would you say? Craig, first of all, the, the th things you said are obviously incredibly meaningful to me. And uh, what I've tried to do over these years is just make your vision become a reality. And I never set out for us to be number one on Glassdoor that wasn't a part of it. I did set out though to build, um, to have a great team, a passionate team, passionate about a very, for what is to us the most important mission. And, uh, and, and I think it does, if you'd have asked me three years ago, what did I think the single biggest impact is into having a fully engaged team, a team and I would have said the individual leader. And I think that's incredibly important, but I have actually changed my view and I have to have the right people on this team. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have the right people on the team that have the, same, the right set of values that are motivated and passionate about what we're gonna do, I don't care how good a leader I am, uh, I'm not gonna be able to get that group of people where I need them to go. And I think leaders, we overestimate our ability to develop. Uh, so anyway, I would say um, focus on having the right people here. Uh, focus on the on the mission and the passion and drive to do that. And then I think the byproduct, like you said, will be a great place. I, I think people will wake up and want to be excited about where they come to work. And I think too many times we get in their way. And so as a leader, I just try not to get in the way yep. and let them be fully expressed the passion that's inside of them. Yep. Well, your, um, your results are special and the team that you've created around you um, they're incredible gifted people and I give them um, all the credit in the world for creating a, a special culture. Thanks so much, Jerry. And some of you may have questions and want to talk more about this. And so let me encourage you to do this. If you'd like a little more information about what we talked about, you can go to life.church slash leadership podcast. You can sign up for our leader guide and we'll send this out with each episode. In this leader guide, what we're going to do is I'm going to have them link to the specific different podcast episodes that Jerry mentioned on culture, hiring, and such. And then also, I'm gonna have them include our core values. You may be wondering, you know, what do you value? We'll show you very specifically. We'll also add our sustaining attributes that might give you some words or language to work with your team around in getting those sustaining attributes so you can hire well, empower people, and do great things together. Now, the first Thursday of next month, we got a new podcast coming out. It's Problem Solving Like a Boss Part Two. If this is helpful to you and you can write a review anywhere you consume the content, it helps create exposure. We're gonna work really hard to bring um, high value content to you in a short period of time um, in each and every episode. Also, if you don't mind sharing on social media or inviting others, that would mean a lot to me. Anytime you tag me, I'll see a lot of those and repost some of them. We're trying to invite others to become great leaders because we know that we can make a big difference as we grow in our leadership. We say it all the time, Jerry, I'm gonna ask you to help me out. Right. Be yourself because People, people would rather, rather follow, follow a leader, leader who's always, always real, real than one that's always right. See you in the next episode. Thank you for joining us at the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. If you want to go even deeper into this episode and get the leadership guide or show notes, you can go to life.church slash leadership podcast. You can also sign up to have that information delivered straight to your inbox every month. In the meantime, you can subscribe to this podcast rate and review it on iTunes and share with your friends on social media. Once again, thank you for joining us at the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast.